Good morning, everybody. Okay, okay. Right. It's good so to good to see you this morning. I'm glad you came back. But uh, I've been looking forward again to, uh, uh, to, to going back into Two Kings. Uh, I've just got a little bit of a, a thing to tell you. We are very lucky people. And the reason we are lucky is we are in the only air-conditioned room in the whole complex. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, though. Keep... You know, don't be a Christian about it and go and gospel everybody. Just keep it a secret. Because <laughs> we... No, no, that's not right, is it? Uh, anyway, let me, let me lead us in a prayer as we begin. We're going to be looking, at least in part, uh, to the story of Naaman and his turning to the Lord God. And he says this lovely phrase. Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Behold, I know there is no God in all the earth but this God that we worship, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah. And Lord, we pray that that may be our conviction by the end of this time together as the word is opened. We pray that you would be with Andrew and give him clarity of thought and help him to open up these scriptures and we pray that you would uh, give him your spirit to guide him in, in the way he says things. But we thank you that you are present where two or three are gathered. Yeah. And that you will teach us so that we might know. And know in a way that is not just in our heads, but mm. works its way through uh, into our lives. Mm. So we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much, Steve. Nice to see some of you back. Is anyone here for the first time today? He's not been to any. Hello, welcome. Good to see you both. Um, anyone who's here who missed Tuesday? Okay, so lots of us have been here the whole time. A few have missed some of the sessions. I think we need some revision anyway, don't we? Because it was... <laughs> We do. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> just a minute. Um, <laughs> you're all ready to go. Um, so just to summarise sort of in normal words, and then we'll do it the more fun way. So on the first day, we saw that um, here is an evil time for Israel, where many people are turning away from the true God to serve Baal um, under the evil king Ahab. And there's this showdown of the rain competition and then the fire competition, which isn't really God fighting Baal, it's God fighting to win back the hearts of a people who've wandered so much that they're kind of wavering, just like the prophets of Baal limp around the altar. The people are limping between the two opinions. Is Yahweh God? Is Baal God? They just don't know. And then God acts so that they do know the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And there's, there's some kind of turning back to God. Uh, there's a 7,000 who, um, who returned him, who are loyal to him. But most people still, and in particular the king and queen, are still apostate. They're still worshipping Baals. And uh, Elijah is very troubled by this, as he should be. And he goes up to um, Mount Sinai, the, the mountain of the covenant, um, seeking God's face and, and wondering whether God will renew the covenant as he did after the golden calf. But God comes with all of the, um, the spectacular that you remember from Mount Sinai. There's an earthquake and there's wind and there's fire. But God is not in the earthquake or the wind or the fire. And God doesn't renew the covenant. Instead, God says, enough's enough. It's time for judgment to fall on this people. Send the assassins. Remember, there are three of them. Hazael, king of Syria. And Jehu, king of Israel. Elisha son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, as the prophet. And between the three of them, they're going to bring God's judgment on the nation. But we saw as well that God's judgment is announced before it is experienced. So God predicts it, but it's not here yet. And that, of course, is the situation that we're in. Because God has fixed a day, we're told, on which he'll judge the world with justice by a man he's appointed and has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. 
But, you know, here is the world and it goes on every year just like it did the previous year and people say, where is this coming? You know, what, why should I take seriously a promise about something that's still in the future that hasn't happened yet? And we saw on Tuesday, one of the big themes of uh, One and Two Kings is that what God says happens and you can't avert it by wishful thinking um, as Ahab hopes that he'll be okay in disguise in the battle to win back Ramoth Gilead. And yet God predicts his downfall and so he dies. Or his son Ahaziah, who um, consults Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, when he's ill. And God decrees that he'll die. And then he tries with three platoons of soldiers to overturn God's word, but it fails and he dies. God's word will come to pass. And so we finally meet Elisha. One bit of the story that we didn't cover, we'll look at a bit tomorrow, is the handover from Elijah to Elisha. And you probably know the story as they cross the Jordan River and they part it. Um, and um, Elijah hands over his cloak or his mantle to Elisha. Um, and then he sees Elijah go up in with chariots um, into the sky. We'll look at that a bit more tomorrow. But here's a summary then of everything so far. When the people had an evil king, they worshipped Baal, a terrible thing. God said, he's a fake, but if you're in doubt, let's see which of us can end the drought. Or if you prefer, light a barbecue. What's wrong, Baal? Are you sleeping? Have you gone to the loo? When the people see the fire, they exclaim, the Lord, he is God, and it starts to rain. Ahab and Jezebel won't repent, but miserable Elijah to Sinai sent. But God's not in earthquake, fire or wind. No more second chances, that's how bad they sinned. Instead, God dispatches the assassins, three, but tells us 7,000 who ain't bowed the knee. Ramoth Gilead is the test. Shall we go, Micaiah, or give it a rest? The others all said what we want to be true. Only a pessimist would listen to you. But off to the battle Ahab goes in disguise, but God's word always comes to pass, and so of course he dies. His son is just as awful when lying in bed sick. He sends to Baal of Ekron, but his men return too quick, for they were intercepted by a man of hairy gown who told them there's no chance at all your king is coming down. Up in the chariot the prophet goes, leaving his successor to deal with God's foes. Elisha is the man with Elijah's cloak. Elisha's now the water parting prophesying bloke. And there we are. And... Thank you. Remember, Elisha is the assassin. Right? We, we've name-checked him back in 1 Kings 19. We're, we're told about him in relation to bringing the sword. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. He is the expected assassin. We're expecting him to bring judgment. So even though people are troubled by the story of um, the youths who taunt Elisha for being bald, and when he calls down the bears and they, um, they kill the boys, people find that troubling, but it's actually very unsurprising because he is an assassin. He is an agent of judgment. And when people taunt God's prophet, people from Bethel, remember where the golden calf shrine was, we're expecting God's judgment to fall, and it does. That is unsurprising. But you might say it's what happens next that is really out of character. Because Elisha, the judge, then starts saving people. And he saves people a lot. The first one we saw actually is just a hint of it, didn't we, on Tuesday, when he's at Jericho and he makes the water, he decontaminates the water miraculously. So it's safe to drink. And Jericho, of all places, you know, Jericho, the cursed city. Jericho, the, the place where Heel of Bethel had lost two of his sons in rebuilding the city, according to the prophecy that God had made to Joshua, son of Nun. And yet Elisha brings salvation to Jericho. We, we read, um, in, that's in chapter 2 of 2 Kings. Chapter 3 of 2 Kings, um, Elisha delivers the whole country, the whole nation, from Moab and you maybe know the story it's when uh, the Moabites are attacking and the Israelites run out of water 
So they're all good. I mean, you can un understand this, can't you? In this heat, if you've been walking at one of the fells and you didn't bring enough water in your water bottle and you're thinking, I'm going to die. Well, th that's what they thought. They were in battle with no water. And then God sends water, and it's a kind of double miracle because the water provides for the Israelites to drink, but also the rays of the morning sun reflected in the water misleads the Moabites because they think they're seeing a battlefield with pools of blood and they all panic um, and they rose and, and, uh, and then the Israelites over, overturn them and, and conquer them. So in chapter 3, the whole nation is saved. In chapter 4, we're going to look at in a bit more detail, various people, all sorts of people are saved. In chapter 5, famously, Naaman the Syrian is saved. We're going to spend most of our time actually on that. Um, then in chapter 6, again, the whole nation is saved, this time from the Arameans um, uh, and from a famine. So we're expecting him to be the judge, the judge, the assassin, but instead he just rescues a lot of people. And we're going to focus our attention on two of those chapters, on chapter 4 and chapter 5, and get through as much of it as we can. So um, let's plunge into... I'm going to read all of chapter 4, actually, but quite quickly. And I want you, as I read it, to see if you can spot any, anything about the people who are saved that they've got in common. Okay, so that's just something so that you can concentrate. I'm going to read it, but what do you notice about the people whom are saved? What have they got in common? So chapter 4 of 2 Kings. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbours for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind him and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. He said, there isn't another one, there's not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. So she went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he passed by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put it in a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then when he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she's no son and her husband is old. Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew... And one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. His father told his servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. So she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so that I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. 
When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me why. Didn't I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said. Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. If anyone greets you, don't answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So she got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on the couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got back onto the bed and stretched out once more upon him. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite, and he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Elisha returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in that region. While the company of prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, put on the large pot and cook some stew for the prophets. One of them went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild gourd plant and picked as many of its gourds as his garment could hold. When he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. Elisha said, get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe corn, along with some ears of new corn. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord said, they will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. It's such an amazing chapter, isn't it? And even just to read it out is, is wonderful. Um, and here are five episodes where Elisha saves people miraculously. So in every case, you know, he does something amazing, extraordinary, um, supernatural, to provide salvation for these people. The first one, the, the bottomless jar the olive oil factory that she sells to make her debts. I mean, it, rem- it reminds me of a, when I was at university and it was over the Easter holidays and a couple of us decided to stay up in college rather than go home just so we could revise before our finals. And one of my friends called Phil, he was an engineering student, he decided that he would, I think it was a form of procrastination, but he decided to re-engineer his entire room to optimise it for revision, which I think took longer than the revision to do. But um, as part of it, he decided he needed to move all of his furniture so that he could remain in one seat and access everything. So there was his kettle, his toaster, his exam books, his stereo. So this project involved rewiring the stereo, and he was doing it very thoroughly, such was his procrastination, that he decided to reattach, move the stereo and then re-earth it so he was looking for something to attach the earth wire to. Thought this, the radiator's a good earth, isn't it? So he started to unscrew a bit of the radiator. Can you see where this is going? And at once, very hot water started to pour out at speed. And Phil thought, oh no. So he runs to the kitchen, gets a saucepan, sticks it under the radiator. The saucepan fills up in about five seconds. <laughs> so he's got the next saucepan, and then the next saucepan, and then the next saucepan. And then you know, it suddenly dawns on him that this water supply is connected to the entire college. <laughs> and it's really, there's really quite a lot of saucepans worth. So it's it, um, even more fruitful than the widow's oil. But unfortunately, unlike her oil, one, you can't sell the water, and secondly, it does not stop 
when there's no more jars. Um, nonetheless, a miracle. And then a kind of double miracle. This Shunammite woman um, receives a son twice. So firstly, when um, she's infertile, or he, her husband's infertile, um, and she manages to conceive. And by the way, just as an aside, I remember hearing Dal Ralph Davis speak on this. And he said there's quite a big theme, isn't there, in the Bible about um, infertile women or people who can't conceive having children. So, you know, Sarah um, in her old age and, um, and Hannah, um, Samuel's mum and so on. It's quite a big theme in the Bible. But usually it's because it's a key point in salvation history where the son is critical to God's purposes in some way. Um, so Isaac, you know, the whole promises are going to come through Isaac. Or Samuel, the whole nation is going to hear from Samuel. And Deborah Davis just pointed out, but in this case, her son's no one important. He doesn't go on to do anything important. It's just God's really kind to this family. And I love that. It's just the sort of lavish grace of God. It's not even sort of necessary to any big plan. He's just really kind to this woman. But this woman receives a son miraculously twice. He, um, she conceives a son and then loses the son. Um, and then receives the son again, a miraculous resurrection miracle. And then another pair of miracles at the end, a starving multitude is fed twice. Um, a deadly stew is decontaminated. And then a few loaves of bread are multiplied to feed 100 people. Um, so an oil miracle, a double son from the dead miracle, and the double food for the hungry miracle. So it's sort of five, but they go into, into groups. Um, the, the stew, by the way, I mean, this is... The Bible's not here just to give us nutritional advice, is it? But if you're a bit hungry on a camping trip, don't just find any plant you can and chop it up <laughs> to make a stew. And actually, the, the Hebrew scholars kind of debate what, what exactly this good could be. And the best guess is it's... Um, I don't know the, the Latin name of it, but it's this particular... Middle Eastern root that is a very strong laxative <laughs> which puts a new angle on the man of God there's death in the pot but um, <laughs> nonetheless it's dangerous to eat and then they can eat it and then there's no well there's hardly any food and then he multiplies it and then they can all eat it the, these are salvation miracles but they are deliberately I think miraculous miracles I mean of course God is always at work to look after his people, but he doesn't usually do it in these kind of supernatural ways. God usually uses ordinary means. Still God's hand, but it's almost like he's going out of his way to do it in unusual ways here. And the bottomless oil, unusual. Or um, laying yourself on top of the boy three times and then he sneezes seven times. The, Seven times is a bit of a miraculous number in 1 and 2 Kings. Do you remember looking for the cloud in the sky in 1 Kings? Seven times. And then sneezing seven times. It's just, there's these little signatures that tell you God is at work supernaturally in this. This is unusual. This is not what we should expect in our lives day by day, I don't think. It doesn't happen usually in the Bible. Even in the Bible, this is unusual. So why have so many miracles all clustered together at this point I think because Elisha is very like Jesus. And God has deliberately placed into history a Jesus preview, if you like. And I've put this table, if you've got the handout. Those who are new with us, we have got handouts for this ses these sessions, which if you haven't got it now, don't worry, but it will be useful sort of summary. You can find it on the seminar page on the Keswick website and just download it. But I've given a... Um, a parallel Elijah, Elisha, Jesus sort of parallels. And you can probably detect them yourself. Um, but Elisha multiplies bread for the feeding of the hundred. We're more familiar with the feeding of the five thousand, the feeding of the four thousand. But, but Elisha got there first. But it's not just that he feeds a hundred people, but lots of details of it are really, really similar to the feeding of the five thousand. For example... There's not enough people. Elisha asks his servants to feed them, which is what Jesus does, remember? He says, oh, go and feed all these people. What? Like, there's hardly any food, Jesus. Same thing. 
But then Elisha insists, no, go and do it, just like Jesus in, insists, go on. And then, amazingly, everyone is fed, and everyone is amazed, and then they have a lot of leftovers. So it's not just sort of roughly the same, it is really exactly the same as the feeding of the 5,000, albeit with 50 times less, fewer people. And then Elijah raises a woman's son from the dead by prayer and bodily contact, contact in an upper room in the presence of a distraught mother. Elisha raises a woman's son from the dead by prayer and bodily contact in an upper room in the presence of a distraught mother. I mean, Elijah and Elijah, it's just really similar. And of course, it's then really similar to what Jesus does when he goes to Nain and meets a widow who's lost her son and raises him from the dead. So they're Jesus-like miracles. And that's telling us that Jesus then is kind of a, well, sorry, Elijah then, Elisha then, is a kind of Jesus preview. And I hinted at this when I um, gave the little intro to the series on Saturday night, but we're going to see a lot more about it, a lot more ways in which Jesus, or Elisha, is very, very like Jesus. Well, here's a couple for starters. He does the same miracles. He multiplies food. He raises um, sons from the dead. I mean, not many people do that in the Bible, but Elisha and Jesus do. Here's another one. Um, They've both got the same name. So um, the, the name Elisha means God saves, which is quite an unusual name to give an assassin, isn't it? Um, the assassin, he's called God saves. And Jesus' name means Yahweh saves. So it's kind of, you know, it's a related name, almost the same name. Um, but also they're the same because both of them we're expecting to come in judgment. Both of them are expected, anticipated, as assassins. So do you remember when John the Baptist um, explains the coming of Jesus? He says, one's coming after me, the thong of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. His winnowing fork is in his hand to gather the wheat into the barn and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. They're expecting the Messiah to be a, a judge, to come in judgment. And that's why Jesus' disciples are quite trigger happy aren't they always asking Jesus do you want to call down fire from heaven on them and Jesus is like no I don't want to but that's what the disciples are expecting they think Jesus is going to be the assassin and then Jesus behaves in a very unexpected way for an assassin he just goes around rescuing people and saving people so in that respect you see Jesus and Elijah it's the same story God's put it in the Bible as a preview of Jesus, the assassin who actually saves people. Well, um, I asked you as I was reading it if you noticed anything about whom are saved in this chapter. And does anyone want to give any thoughts? Whom does he save particularly in this chapter? Anything they've got in common? It says the woman with the oil. There's the mother of the son who dies and is resurrected. Um, There are the prophets who make the stew with a random recipe using wild roots. And then there's the hundred who don't have enough food. Anything they've got in common? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. in, In different ways, there are clues that here are people who still trust in Yahweh, the true God, even in the midst of a country that is all worshipping Baal. So that this is the remnant, this is you know, the 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. It's just a, a minority who are going against the flow. And the, the, they're marked out particularly by the fact that they hang around Elisha. Do you remember Elijah, the predecessor, he didn't have a very good relationship with the government. You know, remember, you know, Ahab and Jezebel wanted to kill him. Um, all of the state religion was opposed to him, the, the fake prophets, and he was on his own. And Elisha, similarly, is, is alone, he's on his own. But there's some people in a Baal-worshipping country who choose to stick with him. 
and identify with him as the prophet of the true God. Let's just look at some of the clues. So, well, some, sometimes um, they're called the sons of the prophets, which is the, that's the group of people who hang around Elisha, the prophets of God. So um, chapter 4, verse 1, the woman is a wife of a man from the company of the prophets. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he feared Yahweh. Right? So this is a widow of a godly servant of the Lord. And she, she mentions that, and Elisha looks out for her. Or verse 38, Elisha went to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region. While the company of the prophets was meeting, he said, make some stew. And it's obviously, you know, there's a, and there's a food shortage, there's a famine, and that's why they're using random routes. And, but he particularly provides for the company of the prophets. There's a subtle one in verse 42. See if you can work out how we know these people are are godly. From verse 42, it's quite subtle. Yes. Yeah, the first ripe corn. And what would you ordinarily do with the first fruits according to the law? You often, at the temple, you bring them to Yahweh at the tabernacle, yeah, but you You can't because you're in Israel up north and Jerusalem is way down south. And so these people say, well, in that case, we'll bring them to the person who represents the true God. We'll bring them to to, to Elisha. Yeah. Um, Particularly when they came from a place called Baal Shalisha. You know, it's actually named after Baal. So here is pagan country, but they seek out, in the midst of a pagan society, they seek out the person who is with the Lord, with Yahweh. And then the Shunammite woman, again, she really sponsors Elisha's preaching. So you know, she is the person who houses the missionary and makes a little, even builds an extension, a loft conversion, we'd say, um, as the Shunammite um, room in the loft. If you do a loft conversion, please do call it that, because I think all Christians' loft extensions should be called the Elisha room or something. Anyway, she builds a room on the, on the roof, and then... Um, Verse 9, I know this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a room for him. So she, you know, she's behind his ministry. But then um, in verse 23, there's a little clue. So her son dies. For some reason, she doesn't tell her husband this. I don't know if he's maybe old and infirm and she thinks it will be too much for him. But she goes, oh, everything's fine, dear. No, everything's fine. I just need to go and see the prophet. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it while she's hiding her grief. And even when she meets Gehazi, she won't say what's wrong. Oh, no, everything's totally fine, don't worry. Of course, it's very far from fine. She's desperate to get to Elisha. He's the only one who can help her. But um, her husband, so he doesn't know where she's going, um, but he's confused, verse 23. Why go to him today, he said? It's not the new moon or the Sabbath from which you infer that when it was the new moon and the Sabbath, she used to go and see Elisha. Well, the new moon and the Sabbath, they were the festivals. And of course, again, she doesn't want to go to Bethel for the festival. Anyone know why? There's a golden calf there. She's not into that idolatrous religion. She wants to honour God truly, so she goes to Elisha. So you see, in all these cases, Elisha is he's saving people, but he's saving specifically the people who are turning to him, who are trusting in God even though the country at large has turned to Baal. Salvation, miraculous salvation, for those who will side with him. And of course that absolutely prefigures the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Uh, In a world that turns away from God, in a world under judgment, in a world facing the day that God has fixed when he will judge the world with justice by a man he's appointed. In that world, those who will turn to trust in the judge can be saved, and saved miraculously, saved in an Elisha-like way. Okay, so that's chapter four. I know we're going really fast. I'm sorry about that, but I want to, I want to spend our last bit of time in my favourite chapter, probably your favourite chapter of 1 and 2 Kings, um, 2 Kings chapter 5, the story of, um, of Naaman the Syrian. But before we start, I want to do a few bits of introduction. Okay, so firstly, here's a question for you. Is Christianity inclusive or exclusive? 
I mean, both is a good answer. Um, it's tricky, isn't it? Because um, a lot of people are cross with, particularly they're cross with evangelicals for being too exclusive. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I know there's some sort of rumblings in Keswick about the convention. Not everyone likes it. If you were to ask people, what don't you like about it? You know, I guess it wouldn't be long before they'd say, oh, they're homophobic or they're very narrow or the, the, those evangelicals, they think they're the only ones who are right. You know, there'll be some kind of accusation of narrowness, probably. It's the thing that people don't like about Christians. Prince Charles, you know, said that when he becomes king, he doesn't want to be known as defender of the faith, which, interestingly, isn't a great title. It was the title given by Henry VIII, sorry, by the Pope to Henry VIII for persecuting Protestants. <laughs> So, yeah, it was actually defender of the Catholic faith against Protestants. But anyway, he didn't want to be defender of the faith. He wanted to be defender of faith. You know, because he wanted to be broader. Um, and yet we can't be broader because Jesus himself was explicit that his way was narrow. In the Sermon on the Mount, enter by the narrow gate. The, the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Um, I'm a minister in the Church of England, as you know. I, I've always been confused about why some people think that it's a good thing to describe the Church of England as broad. I thought it's not a positive adjective in Jesus' teaching, the broad one. Beware of what's broad. That's the way to destruction. But there's a narrow path that leads to life. Or... And then famously, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's narrow. Or there's salvation in no one else, apart from Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, say the apostles in Acts. So it's necessarily narrow in one sense. And I put on the handout, beware the inclusive church movement, I don't know if you know, but there's a, a network of churches called Inclusive Church, but sadly that is actually a title for turning away from the Bible church. So it's, it's a movement that is um, very revisionist about the church's teaching about sex and marriage um, and wants to, you know, embraces people not, not repenting, not living according to the teaching of the scriptures. So inclusive, it sounds like a good word, not such a good word. But at the same time, who wants to be sort of exclusively us and them narrow? That, that can't be Christian either, right? So how do we combine the, the necessarily narrow that Jesus tells us with the desire to be open-hearted? How do we fit together narrow and wide? Well, I love this chapter because I think it is it's maybe the best explanation in the whole of the Bible of how to hold the two things together, I think. And you, you can see if you agree, but I, I mean, I guess there's other passages, but this is maybe the best chapter that I know of to speak into that question, and we'll see why in a minute. Before we go into it, I want us to learn a bit of Hebrew. This is partly in honour of James Robson, the chair of the convention, or the ministry director of the convention, who was my Hebrew teacher. And I thought he'd be encouraged if I put a little bit of Hebrew on the handout. So, James, if you're watching the recording, thank you. And I'm so sorry for my pronunciation if it's now terrible. Um, we're just going to learn um, four words. So the word for boy is a na'ah. Na'ah. Boy. Uh, Nick over there learnt Hebrew with me as well. So, Nick, you can tell me if this is good. Did you know? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> You don't hear me? Brilliant. Well, there we are. No, oh, listen, listen to the voice over here. No, oh, I was a boy. To make something small in Hebrew, you just put the word small afterwards. So you say a boy, a small one. And the word for small is carton, which I remembered. It's like a carton, like a little, milk, a little pint-sized boy. So a, a small boy is a no, oh, carton. No, Okay. To make something feminine in Hebrew, you just put ah oh, on the end of it. So a girl is a na'ara. So a boy is a na'a, and a girl is a na'ara. And to say little girl 
you just say na a ra ka to na, but then you kind of shorten it, so it becomes na a ra ktna. Na a ra. That's brilliant. Um, good. I, um, good. Uh, so that's what we need to know as we go into this story. Now, let me just introduce you to the characters. Firstly, Elisha, we've met him already. Elisha is the saviour judge. He's the Jesus character. So if you see Elisha, think this is a preview of Jesus. Here's the person foreshadowing what Jesus will be like, what, what Jesus will do. That's the first character. The second character I want you to meet is the little girl, or should I say the... <laughs> it's very good. The Na'arakatna. Okay, good. So let's read from verses 1 to 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, um, just notice the, the author's comment. He says that the Lord had given victory to Aram, or to Syria, through him. But I don't expect he knows that, right? So he just thinks, I'm really good at fighting battles. But the author of One and Two Kings tells us he's only good at fighting battles because the Lord let him win the battles. Right, so that's, the, that's a comment for our benefit about the fact that God rules the universe and is behind every victory, but he doesn't realise that. It's like Nebuchadnezzar, you know, thinks, here is great Babylon that I have built. It's like, actually, no, mate, it's just because God let you be the king of Babylon, but bless him, he doesn't know that. He thinks it was him. So um, he's a, a proud man, a, a successful man, um, actually rather an unpleasant man, I think not just a great soldier, but what we would call, um, in modern language, a human trafficker. Because, verse 2, bands of raiders from Aram, from Syria, had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. So, um, we don't know the details, but his armies crossed the border. They seized a young girl and brought her into slavery in their hands. It's not actually a very pleasant thing at all. Um, we don't know if her parents were killed or whether they just have the incredible distress of having their daughter carted off before their eyes. Either way, it's, it's horrible. It's a, it's a grim situation, not without parallels in, I guess, modern warfare. Um, it's the, really the dark underbelly of society, a, a case of human trafficking. But this little girl is amazing. And she is really the heroine of the story, and she is a great model to us. Look at her, what she says, verse 3. She said to her mistress, uh, Naaman's wife, she said, if only my master would see the prophet in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, I don't know about you, I think that is absolutely remarkable, because... Well, for one thing, it is courageous. So Naaman is a you know, powerful man. He's a military commander. He has defeated Israel. I imagine that the L word is not something that you bring up in conversation. You know, leprosy. I mean, you know, he's proud and successful. And there's this fly in his ointment, and I don't suppose he likes it mentioned. And... Oh, about, about your master's skin problem, dear. <laughs> okay, that, that's brave, right? I mean, easily you could be executed or whatever. That, it's courageous. But more than that, it is very surprisingly compassionate. I would imagine, if it was me, that his leprosy would be the one comfort to me. Here's a man who you desperately want revenge against for what he's done to you and your family. And at least, you know, his... Um, at least he's got this skin condition. And I imagine her praying it would get worse. I remember um, somebody uh, at the Cornhill course saying, you know, what do you do when you see that your enemy, your neighbour who's your enemy, has, uh, who lives on a hill, has left his handbrake off? <laughs> and of course the Christian thing to do is to leap into the car and put it on. She 
said, so tempting just to lean against it, <laughs> give it a bit of a push. But, and I can understand that, right? Why does she not want revenge? But then, not only is her response courageous and it's compassionate, but it's also, to coin a phrase, it's also inclusively exclusive. It combines being inclusive and being exclusive in this way. Firstly, it's very inclusive. Who can be saved? Answer, anybody. Even you, sir. Even this human trafficker could be saved if you'll go to Elisha, the man of God. You know, he would cure you, sir. That is amazing, isn't it? That is, you couldn't accuse her of being sort of bigoted and small-minded and closed-hearted. I mean, she is very wide in her mercy. Anyone could be saved, sir, even you. But at the same time, it is very exclusive. How can Syrians be saved? Well, only by the God of Israel not by Syrian gods. If only you go to the prophet, and again, that's brave, isn't it? Oh, with respect, um, ma'am, with respect, your Syrian gods aren't really up to much. In fact, they don't exist. The only hope for your husband, to be honest, is to go to the actual God and his prophet in Israel. You see, it is such an amazing response. She, She is the model Christian because she's brave to say this. She's unexpectedly compassionate to say this. And she's inclusive and exclusive in exactly the right combination. Inclusively exclusive. Now, um, she's the model, I think. And remember that 1 and 2 Kings, the story finishes actually at the end of 2 Kings with the people being in exile in Babylon. So the first readers of 1 and 2 Kings found themselves in a faraway land, miles from home, in a pagan society. So you can imagine if if they were reading this for the first time, she is the character that they immediately identify with because they're now in her position. They're scattered in another foreign land. How should we behave? Well, how about behaving like her? Compassionate, courageous, inclusively, exclusive. Okay, next character. Let's look at the human trafficker. So verse 4, Naaman went to his master, told him what the little girl from Israel had said. Now, By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver. That's 340 kilograms of silver, says my footnote. And uh, 6,000 shekels of gold. That's 69 kilograms of gold. I mean, this is a lot of money, right? So he is willing to pay Harley Street prices. Um, and 10 sets of clothing. I think that isn't sort of change of clothes. I think that's like 10 Versace outfits or 10 Armani suits. Right? This is part of the, the price. I've got a lot of cash. In exchange for this cash, please heal him. The letter he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Full stop. I mean, this is, you know, this is enough to precipitate a total diplomatic crisis. I've got a friend at our church who works for the Foreign Office. This is the kind of thing that keeps him up at night, you know. (laughs) Um, You know, the guy from North Korea sends a letter to South Korea saying, my son's ill, please cure him, thanks. And it's, otherwise I'll press the button. You know, is that, is that, (laughs) this is from the superpower on the border who's already conquered you lots of times, asking you to do something absolutely impossible, right? It's a sort of saber rattling, he assumes it's just a pretext for a, for an, for a battle. It's like Putin you know, sends messengers to Ukraine. Please do something impossible, otherwise I'll invade yours, Putin. I mean, that's what it looks like. So there, he's totally stressed out. Verse 7, as soon as he hears the words left, he tore his robes, which is a biblical way of saying, I'm really very, very upset. I'm not going to demonstrate it because I like this shirt. But imagine, like, you know, this is how upset I am about what you said. Can I, am I God, he says? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. And I love this. This is comedy, I think. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me. Now, to remember, the king at this point... 
the king is a dodgy king, right? So the kings are worshipping Baal. And actually, it's a good thing that the, king, the dodgy Baal-worshipping king of Israel has been humbled because here's somebody asking him to do the impossible, and rightly, he realises he can't do it. So he's humbled by this. I can't kill leprosy. I can't kill people and make them alive. You know, only God can do that. Bingo, sir. <laughs> You're right. For the first time, you got it, theologically. Yes, you can't do this. You need God, don't you? That ought to have been what coronavirus did to our government, shouldn't it? And my God, can I cure a pandemic? But where is that repentance? And similarly, it's not here either. Elisha sort of pokes fun at him. Oh, why are your clothes so torn, sir? You didn't honestly think that you would be able to help, did you? Send him to me and let's get God's help, he says. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. I love this image. A friend of mine um, is a pastor in Melton Mowbray, which is famous for... That's what everyone knows about it. I knew that as well. But um, also, it's fam- it apparently, well, it's less famous for, but it's also the place where the household cavalry have their training ground. So um, the, um, you know, the people on horseback with the ornamental costumes who normally stand outside back in pallets and whatever, but they go to train in, um, in uh, Melton Mowbray. And <laughs> this, is, this friend of mine, his pastor... Um, one of the people in the household cavalry is a keen Christian, or was at that stage, keen Christian, well, so I think he's still a Christian, but I mean, he was then in the household cavalry, keen Christian, getting myself tied up in knots. And he had a choice of where they went on exercises, so he said, well, let's go on exercises to my friend the pastor's house, in the hope that Sam could evangelise them, you know, it's a, it's a great plan. But, you know, he lives in a little house, you know, normal sort of pastor's house in suburbs of this Leicestershire town. And the household cavalry turn up outside. It's quite, it's quite a photo, you know, it looks amazing. And I, I always think of that when I read this verse. You know, so here is, I don't know what kind of houses, you know, Elisha lived in, I guess a normal house. And here's this enormous entourage from, from Syria with all the shekels, etc. And they arrive at the house and Elisha does not even answer the door. Oh, that will be the king of Syria. Go and tell him seven baths in the Jordan and he'll be okay. And at this point, Naaman is very angry. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? You know... Uh, I'd like you to know, by the way, that leprosy has absolutely nothing to do with personal hygiene. I am very clean, and if I wanted a bath, I would wash in one of my superior Syrian rivers anyway. And he turns and he goes off in a rage. And his servants go and talk sense into him and said, look, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing... Wouldn't you have done it? If he said, look, you need a herb that can only be picked at the top of Mount Everest, and then you need to combine it with the ground-up shell of a, of a um, sea creature that can only be found in the Marianas Trench, and then, you know, he'd be up for that. He's a, he's, a, he's a high achiever. It's almost the, it's too simple. It's just too demeaning just to wash yourself seven times. Another seven times, by the way. Do you remember? Seven clouds, seven looks for the clouds, seven sneezes seven washes well anyway they sent they talked sense into him so he went down and dipped himself in the jordan seven times as the man of god had told him his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy now i want you to introduce you to the the brilliance of the um the holy spirit as he inspires two kings because there's a little bit more going on here than meets the eye and I think it's quite cool I hope you'll enjoy it so normally when you do prophecy fulfillment in one or two kings the fulfillment is exactly the same as the prophecy so we, we had an ex- um, we're, we're told um, by Elijah back in um, 1 Kings 17 he was provided miraculously for this woman of Zarephath And he said, she hasn't got any food, remember, and he says, well, this is what the Lord says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry. And then the fulfilment, the jar of flour was not used up 
and the jug of oil did not run dry. Okay, see, it's just exactly the same words. We saw the same, some of us, with the rebuilding of Jericho. Do you remember the prophecy in Joshua? Um, he will lay its foundations at the cost of his firstborn. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. And then hundreds of years later, Heel of Bethel rebuilds Jericho, and he laid its foundation at the cost of his firstborn. And he set up the gates at the cost of his youngest. It's, it's exactly the same. But if you look in 2 Kings, it, it's not quite like that. 2 Kings 5, look at verse 10. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. Then look at what happens in verse 14. He went down and dipped himself in the, seven, in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. His flesh was restored and he was cleansed like that of a Oh, yeah, some of you have got it. Like that of a na'akaton. Why the extra words? You, that's not what you do. You just don't do fulfillments like that in Hebrew. You just say the prophecy, the fulfillment, it's the same. But it's the prophecy, it's fulfillment, it's the same. And then a little extra bit, which you really pick up on because it's unusual. His flesh was, con- was cleansed like a young boy. Now, why say this? Is it just to say, you know, his... His skin was really good. It was you know, like, like as smooth as a baby's bottom, as we say, like a Johnson baby powder advert. No, it's more to it than that, because his flesh was restored like the... He becomes like the, the male equivalent of her. Maybe you think I'm reading too much into it, but let me show you that actually he becomes like her in all sorts of ways. Number one, she's not leprous. I mean, that's the obvious one, and he becomes not leprous. Secondly, he becomes a believer in Yahweh. Now I know there's no God in all the world except in Israel. But notice, he becomes an exclusive worshipper of Yahweh. Or you might say, because he's a Syrian, an inclusively exclusive. He knows that he can be included. It's for anyone, even me. But he knows there's only one way. It's only got to be through him. Um, Then, verse 17, he says, can I give you a gift? No, but please can I have as much earth as a pair of mules can carry? For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any god but the Lord. It's a strange idea, but you know how British embassies overseas are called, I think technically the British embassy is still part of the UK in law? So there's a little bit of Paris that actually is part of England. Um, and um, we use the, the phrase on British soil to refer to it. Well, that, that, that's this concept, but absolutely literally. Say, so, please can I have some actual Israelite soil? Because I want to set up a little bit of Syria that's actually part of Israel. Why? Well, because he is conscious that he is really an Israelite now. I mean, he's born a Syrian, he's ethnically a Syrian, but... He's a Syrian who belongs to the people of Israel, but he's got to live in Syria. So he's kind of, even though he's at home, he's kind of in exile at home. He doesn't belong here anymore. Just like her, you see, she's an Israelite living in Syria in a pagan people. He is now an Israelite, a new Israelite living in Syria in a pagan people. And then he says, but please forgive me, Lord, if I, when my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to bow down, he's leaning on my arm and I have to bow also. When I bow down the temple of Rimmon, May the Lord forgive your servant for this. You know, in other words, I I think the other religions are fake. And I've got a very uneasy conscience about going to my state religious events in the state temple. Forgive me. And there's a little joke in the Hebrew, apparently, because the actual name of um, of the god of Syria was Ramanu, and he just changes the sounds around to make it into Rimen, and the word rimen means pomegranate. <laughs> when I go and bow before the pomegranate, <laughs> he's just, you know, he just thinks it's stupid. I'm really sorry about that. Because there's only one God by which I can be saved. Now, it's wonderful, isn't it? Because it's very difficult to, con- to accuse the convert of being a bigot, I think. You know, you, people will say, oh, Christians, they're so Islamophobic. 
you can't really say that easily to the Muslim who's got converted and is now following Jesus. Oh, you hate Muslims, you know, or you're so racist. But I think of a guy in my old church from Pakistan, um, a servant of the Lord Jesus. You can't really say, oh, you're such a racist. No, because he's a Pakistani, right? You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't stick. He's a Pakistani. He wants to reach Pakistanis um, and Bangladeshis with the gospel that he's found. Or I think of a friend of mine who's involved in the, the living out ministry, um, trying to help people who experience same-sex attraction to live according to the Bible. Um, and he himself is same-sex attracted. And a favourite um, accusation against the Christian is it was just so homophobic. It's hard to say that to him, though, isn't it? Like, you're saying it's attractive. You must really hate gay people like yourself. You know, it doesn't really work, does it? Because um, the more mixed we are, people from every background, people who had been Muslims, people who um, had been from various sexual backgrounds, people who... It's obvious that this is very inclusive. Everyone's welcome. But at the same time, it's very narrow. Everyone's welcome, but we're following just this way now. And that, that's the little girl's testimony. And now it's Naaman's testimony because he has become a not our cartoon like her. And then finally, we need to, I need to speed up. Finally, we meet the little girl, we meet the human trafficker, and then finally we do meet a racist. And Gehazi, the servant, is what I would call exclusively exclusive. Uh, not inclusively exclusive, which is the beautiful way to be, like the girl and like Naaman, but in a rather, a, a genuinely, horridly narrow way. So um, Naaman goes off and Gehazi runs after him. Um, and he says this, verse 20. My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean. You see it here, the sort of racist in, in the voice? This Syrian. He was too easy on him and by not accepting him for what he brought. Surely as the Lord is, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He said, oh, everything's all right. My master just said to me, two young men from the company of the prophets, you know, from your new Christian family, have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. I just wondered if I could have a talent of silver and two of those nice Armani suits for them. Oh, yeah, of course, you know, I'll give you twice as much, says Naaman, because... Name is converted now and he couldn't be more generous. He wants to support the gospel cause. Please have as much as you can, as much as you can carry. So he gave him two talents of silver and two bags, two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants. You know, I'll even provide the transport for you to take all this stuff back. When Gehazi came to the hill, he says, oh, I'll take it from here, chaps. Thanks very much. And then tries to sneak off. And then later that day, he goes in and stood before his master. Elisha said, where have you been, Gehazi? Oh, um, nowhere in particular, says Gehazi, except, unlucky, you work for a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> He's got everything on his prophetic CCTV. Elisha said to him, wasn't my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or flocks or herds or male and female slaves. Nameless leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence. His skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. What's Elisha's sin? Is it that he's greedy? Well, he certainly is greedy. Is that he's a, is that he's a liar? Which he is a liar. I think, I think the main problem is, is he's, he's a racist. He's, he's exclusive just as God's purposes are, are open-hearted and, and wide. You know, actually, a couple of chapters later, they are going to plunder the Syrians, and it's fair game. The Syrians are their enemies, there's a war, um, some lepers actually um, plunder them, and it's you know, great news. Everyone's, everyone's rejoicing. Plundering the Syrians, fair play, but not this Syrian, because this Syrian is your brother now. You should be welcoming him into your family. You know, the, the church that says, oh, we don't want any of them. You know, that a Muslim family moves into the street. Oh, I wish they'd go away. No, the Christian view is, oh, if only that Muslim family would know of the Lord Jesus, they could be saved. Or the gay couple that move in next door. Oh, brilliant. You know, if, if that gay couple were to find the Lord Jesus, they could know his salvation. I mean, it, it's a narrow way. There, there would be repentance and life change and 
and we'd have to call them to follow um, in the Lord Jesus' ways. But they could be saved. You know, who could be saved? Anybody. But how can they be saved? Oh, very narrow, only by the one true God. And so I, th- I love this chapter because it shows us that God is inclusively exclusive. And if you want to know who to copy, copy that Na'ara Katna. She's so brave. She's so compassionate, even against someone who's mistreated her. And she is inclusively exclusive. If you're inclusive, you don't bother to do evangelism, do you? You just think anyone can be saved by whatever philosophy they happen to choose. If you're exclusive, you don't bother to do evangelism because you go, I'm okay, who cares about them? But if you combine the two, that this is a narrow way to be saved, but it's for anybody, then you want to tell anybody. And Elisha prefigures the Lord Jesus, the assassin, who brings salvation. We're expecting the judgment to come. Instead, Elisha raises a Shunammite son. A poison stew is healed. The sons of prophets fed as Elisha multiplies 20 loaves of bread. Even a Syrian can be saved. He washes in the Jordan. He to the tree God prays. He even takes Israel's soil for his own. Now he's become Na'ar Khartoum. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this girl, this little girl, and we look forward to meeting her one day in the new creation, and Lord, what a servant she is of yours. We thank you for her courage as a lone voice of of, um, the true faith in the midst of an enemy household at great risk to herself. Thank you for her courage. Thank you for her compassion, Lord, against somebody who had trafficked her, and yet to whom she wants salvation and grace and lord thank you for her realization that there is only one way to be saved but it is for anybody and we pray that we'd be like her as we go from keswick give us the same heart she had in pointing people to the man of god the man jesus who can save them we pray for jesus sake amen